Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? Yippee ki motherfucker. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film, we explore its themes, its history, the filmmaking, and the influence it has on us today. My name is Steve Morris. I am a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. What's up, everyone? This is uh, the outlaw, John Roca. I'm a writer, producer, and host um, here in San Diego, California, uh, and excited to be getting back into the world of Die Hard. I can't wait. Um, um, and where we left off is right when John McClane is starting to take an active role. He killed Tony, Carl's brother. He put him in the, the Santa Claus hat yep. with now I have a machine gun. Ho, ho, ho. And as Hans is trying to figure out what's going on, John McClane is on the roof of that elevator and that elevator starts going up. <laughs> and that is really Bruce Willis on the roof of an elevator, really going up through the elevator shaft. Wow. Wow. I, I, it's probably not that dangerous a thing, but it looks really scary. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I would say so. Anything could happen. Yeah. And it goes right up. And, even, and again, this is like adding the little thrills. Is It's already kind of exciting that to see this guy going up on the roof of the elevator. But yeah. then there's those moments where the he almost hits that big beam when it gets up to the ceiling. Mm -hmm. The elevator is actually at the Fox building. That's their real elevator. But as soon as he steps out from the top of the elevator, we're back on a set. And he goes through this little kind of corridor in more of the maintenance area. And there mm -hmm. on the wall is a centerfold. Mm -hmm. I can't quite explain it but that centerfold is important like just okay. that production design well a it does what mctiernan's been doing through this whole thing it, he wants you to know the geography yeah you know mm -hmm. and b it adds like a humanity to the build like you feel oh they're guys who work back here yeah. who we never see you know what i mean absolutely and then bruce like ladies which is really <laughs> funny and then we cut to carl alexander goodenough's reaction to his brother, and he just tosses the desk. One blood, you'll have it. And this is another plot, which is that Carl wants revenge, mm -hmm. and Hans is continually trying to settle him down. This is low. Him killing Carl's brother is low key the best thing he does in the movie. I don't mm. think he wins if he hadn't killed Carl, uh, Carl's brother. And by the way. Was it Tony? Is that his brother's Tony. name? It wasn't on purpose. Like they were no. falling down the stairs and not to say that he wouldn't have killed him anyway, but he was falling down the stairs with him. And then it just happened to work out that he cracked his neck. Now him putting him in the sweatshirt and writing the message that's adding insult to injury. That's what puts Carl in a place of pure unadulterated anger about the situation. He becomes the random X factor of this entire situation uh, because as you just said, Hans spends almost the rest of the movie trying to calm Carl down, trying to get him to listen. And Carl makes a couple of classic mistakes that allow John McClane yeah. to have the upper hand in critical moments uh, and lead to both eventual Hans's death and Carl's death as well. I totally agree. And the thing is, is that, again, this is just such great screenwriting. Mm -hmm. Is what, what it does is that you increase all these other conflicts. Like John... Could have just killed a random guy and done the ho 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 thing. It would still be great. Right, right, right. Is that, but the fact that he kills Carl's brother and Carl is our scariest bad guy right. adds a whole emotional element to Carl, but it also creates a conflict between Carl and Hans. So yeah. every scene going forward between Carl and Hans is more interesting. One yeah, of and he didn't yeah. even know that he was killing Carl's brother. So it was no. a happy accident, so to speak, for him at least. Well, and, and it also kind of feels like an unhappy accident because you now you have this really dangerous guy True. hell bent on killing our hero, True. which makes everything much more exciting. Mm -hmm. By the way, one of the things that Steve D'Souza did when he came onto the film, and I think this is a great way to think about your screenwriting, mm -hmm. is that he's tried to very hard to think about this movie as a story about Hans Gruber as the protagonist <laughs> and John McClane as the antagonist. Hmm? That Hans has a goal. He this is what he is trying to do, and it's his true. obstacle is John McClane. You know? Mm -hmm. And that's part of what fills out that character and that relationship so much more. I can't wait for the Cobra Kai TV series based on Die Hard. 
Oh my god! Where it's John, where John McClane is the asshole. Uh, I'm looking forward to that one. I think that is. I think somebody <laughs> needs to work on that. I think that's a great idea. And of course, as Carl is getting m- mad and Hans is settling him down, Holly and Ellis are watching, mm. and Holly is figuring out what's going on. Cops, John. Oh Christ! He can fuck this whole thing up. What does he think he's doing? His job. Bullshit. His job's 3,000 miles away. And how does Ellis feel about the fact that John McClane is getting involved? He is not happy. I know that. And But also because he's high on coke. Right. And he's he senses this is a guy that's competition for Holly's hand. The last thing he wants is for this guy to become a hero. Yeah. Oh, that's a great, that's a great, great point. Mm. Men are petty as fuck. Just people <laughs> should know that. Men are petty as fuck. Um, John, up on the roof. Mm-hmm. Has his radio, gets on channel nine and calls out Mayday. Of course, the thing about the radios, and this is, and I'm not sure that it's always played perfectly throughout the film, is that Hans and Carl can listen to that. Yeah. yeah. So they're listening as, as, as John calls in, gives a description of everything, the hostage situation, the terrorist, where he is. I love the woman who is on the emergency channel. Attention, whoever you are, this channel is reserved for emergency calls only. No fucking shit, lady! Do I sound like I'm ordering a pizza? Oh, yeah. That's a great line. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. By the way, there have to be policies of someone calls in a terrorist hostage situation. Oh, yeah. I mean, this scene is so ridiculous. There are numerous ridiculous scenes in this movie, (laughs) but that's what speaks to the brilliance of this film is that you excuse it because the overall uh composition of the movie is fantastic so you allow the johnson and johnson bullshit you allow the Dwayne bullshit you allow all this it would never happen a million years um you allow or swat guys stopping because thorns scratch their hands <laughs> like all that crap it would have never existed in real life but you allow it because mclean ha- you like bruce willis as john mclean totally and it's just one more thing of the of the hat trick or whatever of the mm. of the brilliance of this movie is to be able to have these completely ridiculous silly elements to it yeah yeah and yet be completely evol- involving mm-hmm. and really serious when it wants to be really serious yes yes um while John is trying to convince this radio operator that he's for real, Carl and a couple other guys are going up into the elevator. And this is just another great touch is Carl pulls out the big gun. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is another. It's like, give your big bad guy a different weapon. Yeah. And then he tells them, no one kills him but me. So therefore, if these guys are in a position to take out John McClane, they can't because Carl wants to take out John McClane. So that's. Oh, that also messes with your strategy in a situation like this. Well, and you can see by the reactions of the other guys in the elevator to Carl and that gun yeah. that they're scared of Carl. Oh, yeah. Of course they are. Yeah. By the way, I, had, I, I looked it up. The Car- Carl's gun is a Steyr AUG A1, which is an Austrian assault rifle. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. Good to uh, know. Um, apparently, Alexander Kudinov had had some training with guns. Mm. And I couldn't tell if he had actually like served in the Soviet military or anything like that. But he said, but what he said was that actually really firing them a lot on Die Hard had a really profound effect on him. Like, <sighs> like it was a, it was a rough thing. It sounds like I'm sure, you know, he's a, he's a ballet artist. Like he's an artist. He's creative. The idea of using those weapons in such a way might've affected him emotionally for sure. Back to our emergency call, she says, If this is an emergency call, dial 911 on your telephone. Otherwise, I'll have to report this as an FCC violation. Fine, report me. Come the fuck down here and arrest me. Just send the police now. And it's funny, she hears the loud noise at a radio and still doesn't quite believe it. And he, it's uh, it's all just great. Jumps off the roof, slides down a thing, gets the wind knocked out of him on a railing. <laughs> And we cut from... See if there's a black and white that can do a drive-by. Two Twinkies. <laughs> and Reginald Van Johnson. I thought you guys just ate donuts. <laughs> They're for my wife. Finally, we've gotten to Reginald Van Johnson. His performance, the more I watch it, his performance is phenomenal. Oh, yeah. This guy made a career off of this one performance. Yeah. A yep. whole career off of this one performance. Uh, he still shows up in random places. Originally, the the actors they went after were Robert Duvall, Gene oh. Hackman, and Lawrence Fishburne. Oh, wow. 
It's funny. All of those people are great, but I yeah. think having an unknown actor in the role, because like if Duvall comes in, I don't think that I shot a kid and the drawing the gun works as well. Yeah. Because he's already seems like such a dangerous person. Same with Hackman. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Plus these are old flatfoots. Yeah. I don't know. Hold on. I'm going to look up something real quick because isn't colors around this time too? So colors, maybe a year or two. I would think like 87. Or, but yeah, colors right is around. 88. So that's oh, one year. So it would have been weird for Duvall to be again mm. in, in, you know, like in the uniform and all of that. So yeah, that, that would have been. Fishburne is curious because Fishburne is a different take. It's a younger black man. It's an, a more in shape black man. What is that reaction going to be like to to sideline him? Because they essentially they do until that final moment with Goodenough. But like he's on the side. It's more believable that you have a guy like this who's like, you know, eating Twinkies instead of donuts. Uh, and he's got a little bit of weight on him. It makes you immediately sympathize for the guy. And Reginald Vaughn Johnson's natural energy makes you sympathize with the guy. Yeah, really I think well. it's I think it's his softness and likability and yeah. his basic friendliness that makes this whole thing work. Yep. You know, and I'm not saying that Duvall Hackman and Fishburne, who are all amazing actors, couldn't play that, <laughs> but they bring a lot of who they are to the thing, you know? Yes. Right. Um, and, you know, we get some jokes about that. All these Twinkies are for his wife. And he is humming, <laughs> uh, walking in a winter wonderland, which is mm -hmm. what was used as one of the leitmotifs with the terrorists earlier. And he gets the call about Nakatomi and he starts to get into his car and then he turns around and looks up because there is the building. And now we cut to John under fire, firing back. And as he's under fire by the two terrorists, the camera tilts up to the slow walk of Carl mm. with the big gun across the roof. And when Carl opens fire, again, all the details are so good. His gun sounds completely different. Yeah. It's like a cannon he's firing at him. And John breaks through the door, and then there's this big fan in front of him that's blocking his way. They come out after him, and mm -hmm. Bruce, we cut back in, and he has stopped the fan with his gun. And just as he gets through, the, the fan starts going, kind of protecting him from the bullets. I think this is great construction because you have all these things to be scared of. Yeah. Is you are scared of the guys with the guns. You're scared of the fan, which could break through at any time. And then the fan almost cuts his feet off just as he gets through. And even the fact that the motor on the fan is steaming <laughs> gives you a sense of the power that's being held back. And again, mm -hmm. it's all the little details that make so much of Die Hard so exciting. Agreed. He gets to the elevator shaft. The elevator's not there. Sees a the screen gets through the screen, looks down into this, what looks like an AC shaft or something. And it is a long, long way down. Yeah. And, and what's great too is A, we know he's kind of afraid of heights because of the scene on the plane. Yeah. And now he does this crazy thing, which is by the way, in the book of using the gun and pulling the strap out so he can hang down to the shaft and hopefully grab onto the opening to this air duct. He's an elevator shaft. Perfect. The elevators are locked off. You can't escape. Just shut him in and come back down. And so now we have John McClane hanging by the strap of his gun, Fuck. trying to get down to this vent opening. Hmm. And this is a stuntman who is hanging above a mattress that is painted to look like uh, <laughs> an infinity. You know, it's like That's smart. it's painted with forced perspective. So it looks like it goes on forever. But it's really only like 20 feet below him. And then John falls. That was not supposed to happen. Oh, wow. That is the real stuntman who was supposed to j grab that ledge actually falling. Yeah. And they go, oh, crap, we have to do it again. Like, we're going to have to set this whole thing up and start from the beginning. And I think it was the editor who said, no, no, let's use that. It's yeah. a great, great shot. So they just cut to him then catching just with his fingertips to get through this thing. That's the refrigerator moment. What I, you know, what I've dubbed every moment in any action film where you're like, you're either in or you're out after this moment. And to me, that's the refrigerator moment because the way he's falling, Steve, no way he catches on to any of those. Yeah. The timing of that would be astronomical. And second of all, the force with which you're oh, falling yeah. and the weight, you will have pulled out both your shoulders and there's no way you hold on at that point. So I, I think it's, it's, uh, it doesn't, it's the, it's the one moment of disbelief in the film that I think bothers me. And then everything else, 
I can make a case for, I can excuse, but this is the one moment where it looks very clearly like there's no way he can grab onto this at the speed he's going. I totally, totally get what you're saying. Mm. It's so funny. Like there is a level to which we can stretch our belief. Yes. Stretch. And there's a level work. and the, the refrigerator is one where I just can't. Uh, yeah. It's like, no. Well, and then, you know, in that movie, you've got swinging with the monkeys. And right. it's, what's so weird about it is, and, and I think this is actually a really good point that you bring up. There's all sorts of insane things that Indiana Jones does in the other films. Yes. And yet there's just one level where you go like, where I went like, nope. <laughs> And maybe it's the way it was done. I don't know. Yes. Yes. But the swinging with the monkeys was just like, I, I, I couldn't go. I, I was out. Not that I was really in that movie to begin right. with. Once you, once you bring nuclear war into the equation, all the other stretching of beliefs is a whole nother. It's a whole nother yeah. thing. Man. Bruce Willis is in the air duct, crawling around in the dark, turns on his lighter. Come out to the coast. We'll get together. Have a few laughs. <laughs> so apparently Stephen D'Souza, like McTiernan just gave him a standing order. Like if you think of a funny line, call it in. And so he called that line into the set <laughs> and just said, I, I've got an idea. You're doing the air duct scene tomorrow. Right. And they go, yeah. It's like, have him say this. That's, <laughs> that's, that's how that happened. That's a rare thing with writers. And now the bad guys who knows that he's in the ducting have come in through the executive suite. They're oh, yeah, looking right. up at the ducks. John is looking down through the grate sees Carl and Carl just opens fire. And I love the shot that starts on the hole that he shot through right in front of John's face that is smoking. Mm -hmm. And then Bruce Willis is just, it's like his performance is so perfect. Cause it's like, he's terrified yeah, and he is not moving or barely breathing. Cause he's a, mm -hmm. he knows how close he is to getting killed. Right. And then Carl starts just pushing up. This brilliance. I love yeah. this. I hadn't even, like when he started doing it, I was like, oh yeah, that's genius. Of course, yeah. the extra weight, you'd know. Yeah. And he gets right almost there, and then he gets called away. Carl, call him before he's tired. Nothing says he wouldn't have gotten out of that situation, but it's not, it's it's a great moment that it's so close to him possibly getting caught. Um, by the way, one of the things in this movie, it's true in all movies, is that you have a with the, with the wardrobe department is you have a, a calendar that says not just what the shooting days are, but what day it is within the movie. So if you have a movie right. that takes place over six months and you're shooting something that happened on the 12th day uh, early in the shoot, and then you also are shooting at the middle of the shoot and you're shooting it later the shoot, you have to make sure the per characters were in the same clothes mm -hmm. that, okay, on this day he was wearing this thing. And even to the degree of was his tie loosened or was it tight or what, you know, where are we? Um, with John McClane, it's only one day. He's only in one outfit, but it has to get dirtier and bloodier as they go along. Yeah. But they're not shooting in order. So they have to know really, really specifically, okay, at this moment, this is how dirty it is. Right. And several people say this is where they blew it. Is oh. he got way too dirty way too early when he comes oh. out of the air duct. Okay. And then he becomes sort of less dirty for a while and then gets more dirty. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's a great point. So up comes... Al driving up to Nakatomi <laughs> Plaza decides to go talk to the guard. Huey Lewis. <laughs> you totally looks like Huey Lewis. Yeah. And he does his charming sort of Texas thing. Evening officer. What can I do for you? Where he's like betting on the game and he's like, Oh, I had 20 bucks on those guys. You yeah. Know, all of that thing. And he's got the cowboy boots and every one of these guys that we interact with has a character, has yep. a little moment. John is getting impatient. And he grabs a chair and starts smashing the window, which, of course, the bad guy's here. And Al's kind of looking around the lobby. Doesn't find anything. Says, the hell with this. He's walking out. And into where John McClane is in the executive suite comes a guy. And there's just a yelling standoff about lowering your gun, lowering your gun. Yeah. And then the other guy, who might be Heinrich, comes in behind him. Yeah, it's Heinrich. And it's, it's Marco and Heinrich. <laughs> And John kills Heinrich. Yes. And Marco comes after him, and John is underneath oh. that crazy triangular angular table. <laughs> you are done. There's no more table. And this is such a memorable moment with Marco not shooting him 
he's f- messing with him. Right. So he's shooting on alternate sides mm. to get him to push all the way to the end of the table so that he can put it. So he's almost torturing him before he kills him. There's a sadism to what he's doing in that in that sequence. And that's what ends up costing him instead of just taking him out with a machine gun, which is what he has. or so just like yeah. riddling the table with bullets. He thinks he's in control in that moment, messing with the guy. And he's being chatty while he switches clips. Yeah, you yeah know? don't do that. <laughs> Bruce looks to his left and right before he shoots him. So it's almost like he wants to make sure if I use these bullets, uh, I don't need them to kill anyone else right now. So it's a smart little thing that he does, and I love it. Next time you have a chance to kill someone, don't hesitate. And then Bruce opens fire from under the table. So Bruce is firing, I think, full round blanks mm. fairly close to his face Yeah, through this table. So it's in an enclosed space. Oh, shit. It was so loud. He lost two thirds of his hearing in one ear permanently. What? From this moment. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, my God. And then we're down with Al, who's <laughs> now humming Let It Snow, I think. Gets into his car. You have the craziest angle from like below the steering wheel up past the gear ship through the windshield looking mm-hmm. up at the body coming straight down and slamming <laughs> into the car. <laughs> Can I just say that what John McClane does here seems very dangerous? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> like he easily could kill this cop. Mm-hmm. But Al puts the car into gear, backs up. John opens fire on the police car with a machine gun. It's like there's no way you can be sure you're not going to kill this cop. <laughs> and I love, by the way, they take the time as the co- as the police car backs up and jumps off this, like, mm-hmm. over this wall, that they take the time to cut in to Argyle <laughs> in the limo <laughs> and watch this thing jump in the background. And I just That's go smart. like, it's amazing, but, like, to set up that shot. While you're doing this stunt, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure they have five cameras on on the on the thing. Right. But one of them, they're like, we have to get Argyle. We have to get him in his limousine. We have the camera on him yep. with that in the background to get this shot. Also, it's just that's a lot. But it's also smart. You keep Argyle in people's mind again. You yep. remind them Argyle is down there because he's going to play a part in this. So Well, and it's funny. Yeah. It makes this moment really, which, you know, again, <laughs> a dead body just landed on this guy. Yeah. John is hitting his flashing lights with a machine gun. It's a really dangerous thing that's happening. Well, I don't it's think funny. he's the only one. I think the other guys are shooting out the window, if I remember correctly, uh, as oh, really? well. So they're I sh- thought it's I just thought, John. So maybe they're together and shooting it. Uh, maybe maybe, uh, maybe I'm wrong. I, I, I just remember them uh, shooting out the window mm. at him as well. Um, and now we have one of the most famous lines in Die Hard. <laughs> Welcome to the party, pal. <laughs> I've said that so many times under so many circumstances. <laughs> but it's so believable the way he backs up, destroys yeah. that concrete uh, pillar, that little mini concrete pillar that's there, just shatters it, runs all the way. And then the way he comes off the back, it's just like kind of the car angled like that. Then the door opens and all the Twinkie wrappers. So that's the Twinkie plant right there. Yep. All the Twinkie wrappers are all crushed out, flowing out as he climbs out of that, uh, of that uh, cop car. It's so great. We're even going to get more mileage out of these Twinkies later on. And yeah. here, here is a key question, John. I think this is okay. puzzled people throughout Uh-oh. millennia about Uh-oh. this movie. Mm-hmm. Are the Twinkies for his pregnant wife? <laughs> I'm going to say yes and no. I'm going to say he's taken a couple of Twinkie packs for himself and the rest are for his wife. Yes. I I think his wife hates Twinkies. Yeah, really? <laughs> I think he's just using it as an excuse. Why would another why would an overweight guy lie to another overweight guy about getting Twinkies late at night? That makes no that's a level of pride I don't or ego I don't understand. Like <laughs> homie working behind the counter at 2 a.m. Ain't doing much with his life. So what do you care that he judges you for getting a bunch of Twinkies? So. You're saying that uh People aren't insecure about weird things in real moments. No, I'm as as an overweight guy. (laughs) I I, I haven't done exactly this. First of all, I don't like Twinkies. (laughs) I haven't done exactly this move, but I have I have shame eat eaten, you know, silently with no one knowing. Oh, sure. I do that, too. I I struggled my way my whole life. So, I mean, uh, but I know when I see another uh, heavier guy, there's a kinship there. And I don't have to explain myself to him if I'm getting some food because I know he's done the same thing at some point. (laughs) William Atherton. (laughs) Ah, the great 
the great dick of the 80s. William Atherton. We get both of them. We get the two oh, greatest true. dicks yes. of the 80s in yes. this movie. That's yeah. amazing. And he overhears Al on the, he's at the newsroom and overhears him on the police radio. And a, a great rack focus uh, to him, from him to the radio as he hears this. Mm -hmm. And then we're back at Nakatomi Plaza and the cops start to show up. Mm-hmm. And there's tons and tons of something we're going to see a lot from Jan de Bont that used to be a mistake. That there was a thing that you would always try to stop from happening in cinematography mm. because it really shows that things are being shot. And that is a lens flare. Oh, yeah. Oh, JJ made a whole career out of this. Yeah. What do you mean? This used to be a thing where it's like, no, you, you have a light that's hitting the lens and it's creating this bright light and it makes it look. You, can, you notice the lens, essentially. Yeah. And this is one of the key movies that made it. A, a, an okay thing that's cool and in fact i mentioned that on patreon we mm -hmm. have uh, a bunch of people get advanced notice of what our film is going to be and get to yeah. ask questions and here's one of our first patreon questions okay from ryan lieb who says can we talk about lens flares what do you guys think of this technique in terms of visual so style does it add something mean meaningful to the scene and can you speak at all to how or why the trend got started on cinema in the first place mm. John, what do you think about lens flares? I love lens flares when they're used correctly. And uh, I think they add a certain level of beauty to the shot. Um, and I think it takes a certain level of expertise to understand the lighting to get correct on a lens flare shot. So all the shit they used to give JJ, and I, I never understood it because to me, I'm like, I like these fucking lens flares. These are great. You know the style. It's like complaining about Spike Lee's like, putting the guy on the dolly shot and moving right. him through like those are signatures of directors and so when people complain about it i just go shut up and go make something yourself like i just it drives me nuts uh so to me i liked it i love it i think it's worked it works so well here it's worked well in numerous films with uh, jj but if you don't know how to use lens flare lens flares correctly in your movie it's a glaring cop out or it's a glaring misstep in your film and it completely undercuts your film and undercuts your talent as a director I think it works great here, both here mm -hmm. in Die Hard and in 2009 Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And it works really well for different reasons, I think. I think here it works really well because it kind of shows the realism of the space. You yeah. know what I mean? Like there's yeah. just, there's lights everywhere and not everything is perfect. And we, you know, it's like having crazy shadows is that you have all these crazy flashing lights because you have mm -hmm. cop cars and emergency lighting and that's, and you have headlights and you have the lights from the cameras, from the news van and things like that. Yeah. And that really works. And I think it works well in Star Trek for the opposite reason is because what JJ is saying is that's that world. Yeah. That world is sparkling and bright with light everywhere. And mm -hmm. I think it was a really, really cool choice, particularly combined with the going back to the old colored uniforms um, from the original series is that yeah. I, think it, I think it worked really well. I love the way it worked. And I totally agree with you. It is overused sometimes and is really terrible when people do I think I think for me it's like well why are you doing lens flares mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you have an argument for why this works in this film like I think both these movies do I think great yeah. if it's just like lens flares are cool which is like yeah. what my students do all the time you know there's so much where my students when they're starting out are just going <sighs> Long tracking shots are cool. Therefore, I will do a long tracking shot or lens flares are cool or yeah. wide lenses are cool rather than and not thinking about, well, why is that a good choice for your particular movie? Yeah, right. you got to earn the shots. All of you relax. This is a matter of inconvenient timing. That's all. Police action was inevitable. And as it happens, necessary. So let them fumble about outside and stay calm. This is simply the beginning. I think the line of police action was inevitable and as it happens necessary yeah is a great line about what's going on in this show is that is that oh they have some kind of a plan yep. you know we have another question from one of our patrons at the roca says he asks steve morris do you think hans is lying every single time he is trying to put a good face or a good look on all the kinks in his plan that uh, um John McClane is doing uh, with every moment, with every decision that he makes. Uh, Using a this as, a, as an example. I don't think he's lying. I think he's arrogant. Okay. That's what I think for most of it. I think there are certainly times where he's trying to settle his people down, but right. I think his whole arrogance is like, 
I've come up with this plan that requires the FBI to come right. and I haven't shared my whole plan with everybody. And I think he is, I think arrogance is Hans's fatal flaw, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. is he just okay. thinks that his plan is so great. That's what, what do you think? That's a great point. I think the combination of arrogance and then as it gets worse, uh, he defaults to this way of trying to put the best picture on it or best face on it. In the end, he's not as in control as he thinks he is. And that's one of the uh, things that comes through very clearly by the end of the film. I thought I told all of you I want radio silence until oh, further... I'm very sorry, Hans. I didn't get that message. I I Wax Tony and Marco and his friend here, I figured you and Carl and Franco might be a little lonely, so I wanted to give you a call. Why do you think John chooses to reveal himself at this moment and and list all the names? Yeah, it's a good question. This is a game of chess that all of a sudden they're playing here. And look, John McClane did not know when he showed up at that park that he was going to be playing chess against a guy who's right. a few moves ahead initially. Right. So he's trying to catch up and reclaim some level of status here, but also unsettle him right he's trying to mess with his mind this any competitor would tell you that's a that's always a part of the game the mental games you play with anybody you're going up against and so as he becomes more confident and as he takes out more of these people and now that he's finally got through the police there's a certain level of shifting of the odds here that he's taking advantage of now because it's safe for him to reach out to him over the walkie-talkie it's safe for him to try to mess with him but it's also a way for him to gauge um, who Hans is, who Hans is, you know, in conversation, maybe have some idea in the back and forth. We'll give him an idea of who this guy might be. So what he might try, what he might do, maybe anticipate some of his moves, that kind of stuff. That's what I think he's doing here. Uh, that's what I think too. I think he's messing with him. And I think it's just, mm -hmm. as you said, now he's taken out a few of the guys. So, and the police have shown up. So where it was all advantage Hans, now it's starting to, to the tide turning a little bit, and I yeah. think he's poking at him. This is very kind of you. I assume you are our mysterious party crasher. You are most troublesome for a security guard. <coughs> Sorry, Hans, wrong guess. Would you like to go for double jeopardy where the scores can really change? This is where, <laughs> why, where you love John McClane. And he's funny. It's not like Arnold one-liners. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like an ordinary guy who's very smart messing with this other guy. And again, it goes from the, like, I'm an American guy who watches TV. Mm -hmm. I don't think Hans knows what double jeopardy is. You know right. what I mean? No, 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 no idea at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but Hans is also trying to find out who he is. So asking yep. him the security guard thing, that's his way of trying to find out who. So Hans is playing his own game here as well. Both of them are. You, know. you have me at a loss. You know my name, but who are you? Just another American who saw too many movies as a child. Another orphan of a bankrupt culture who thinks he's John Wayne, Rambo, Marshall Dillon. It's so interesting. Like I told you in the book, a mm -hmm. lot of the basic plot things are in it. And then when um, Jeb Stewart came on, he's the guy who really came up with uh, what if I had a fight a big fight with my wife and never got a chance to apologize before I died. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That emotional element that came from Jeb Stewart. Mm. One of the things that D'Souza added was this idea of the class structure. Yeah. Like in this speech from um, Hans, an, another orphan of a bankrupt culture, mm -hmm. Stephen D'Souza in his mind was like, this is like an intellectual film critic. Who yeah. poo poos <laughs> popular movies. And that's how he wrote this line. Yeah. I hate those kinds of critics. I hate those kinds of critics. Me too. And I don't mind calling them out, even though I'm in like the community to a degree. I love calling them out because it's just a fucking movie. This is not a place for you to work out your shit and try to be the cool, smarky kid saying the meanest shit in the in the in the playground against another person. It just drives me nuts when I see them do that. To, to me, it does exactly the opposite of what yeah. I think you and I want to do, yeah. which is it's that attitude, that in a super intellectual attitude mm -hmm. separates people from good movies. Yeah. It's like, oh, you can't really understand this film. This film's not for you. If you yeah. don't understand what I'm saying, this film's not for you. And so what you and I are always saying is like, this film is for you. Yeah. Like we have a lot to say about it. Right. But but not in a snooty, you know, right. superior our, way. Our breakdowns come from enjoyment of the movie or exploration of the mm -hmm. movie, 
They're not coming from a place to try to destroy the movie. And, and it's not, I don't want to make other people listening feel dumb because they didn't get the reference to 18th century neo-socialist yeah. whatever, <laughs> you know, like you exactly. shouldn't have to know that stuff in order to enjoy a movie. It's exactly. a movie. Mm -hmm. It's a movie. I was always kind of partial to Roy Rogers, actually. I really like those sequined shirts. By the way, uh, Stephen D'Souza grew up not too many miles away from where Bruce Willis grew up. Oh. And Steven D'Souza loved Roy Rogers. That's wow. where this comes from. Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? And what is John McClane's response to, do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? Ding. yippee ki -yay, motherfucker. yippee ki -yay, motherfucker. It's so good. So good. And it's, yeah. it's my favorite line he delivers in the whole movie. Every other line is, welcome to Party Pal, when the two we just talked about, and come out to the coast. They're all great. But the way he kind of confidently whispers, that's Bruce Willis, when he's just like, yippee ki -yay, motherfucker. It's brilliant. It's what, just such a nice shot to take. What, what? I, I don't I don't even know how to ask this question exactly. <laughs> but why is it brilliant? Because I agree with you. Yeah. It, there's so much about this line that is amazing. <laughs> there's a joy in him saying the line. Mm -hmm. It's a great comeback. Uh, Andrew, you, because he's mentioned Roy Rogers and the cowboy thing, but also you're using a phrase that we've heard so many times. yippee ki -yay. yippee ki -yay, yippee yeah. ki -yay. Oh, You know, we've heard that many times. To add the motherfucker, that's the, that's the cherry on the cake that <laughs> separates it. It really is. Because you've never thought to put those things together in your mind. And it's a, ra it's a rallying call for himself. So he's growing in confidence. And so we now, who were so worried about him, now we're on his side when he says that. Because he's got the guts and the balls to say that to Hans before he escapes to the next thing he's going to do to mess with him. So we like to see that our hero is slowly gaining confidence and uh, changing the stakes, which I like here. And, and here's the thing that I love about it. I, I think that Hans just mm -hmm. fucking attacked America. Did oh, you yeah. hear him attack That's a great America? Point. He did. He did. He yes. insulted our country. He, did. he insulted the Western. And what I love is that he didn't pick John Wayne or Marshall right. Dillon. He picked a singing cowboy. Oh uh, yeah. And Yippie Kaye is out of a song. And yeah. so he is taking the most American and yes, not realistic element of America culture mm -hmm. and just shoved it right back in Hans's face. Yeah. Like, yippee ki -yay, motherfucker. <laughs> and one of the most, what can you say? One of the, one of the nicest cowboys. He's the singing cowboy. Everybody mm -hmm. loved Roy Rogers. You know, I, when I, where I grew up, the Hardys, they were called Roy Rogers before right, they right. changed back over to Hardys. Uh, so like that, you had so much of a connection to that in the eighties that to him insulting Roy Rogers, you've gone too far, son. You've gone too far. And, and you know how a few minutes ago we were talking about the intellectual film critic? <laughs> they would not have spent 10 minutes discussing yippee ki -yay, motherfucker, and they would have lost out <laughs> because that line is True. awesome. It is low. Um, and now William Atherton is arguing because he wants a news van because there's this big story happening in Nakatomi Plaza. I can get the jump on everybody if I get Sam, a remote. I don't have the new pages. Where is the Harvey, Gladden keep report? your pants on, will you? And we have like a three-way conflict where he is talking to his producer who just off camera from the actual news broadcast that's going out. And yeah. it is very clear that the anchor hates William Atherton. And we're having a countdown to start the, the show. And the argument between William Atherton and the news anchor messes him up so he doesn't jump in right away. And right. then the... The co-anchor, she notices that he messed up. Yeah, and the uh, the news anchor is Mary Ellen Trainer, who is Robert Zemeckis' wife at the time. Oh. And she was the psychiatrist in all the Lethal Weapons Oh, that's movies. right. Right. And then, of course, Joan Wilder's sister in Romancing the Stone. Mm. Um, and the mom in Goonies, right? So she was in a number of things here in the 80s, really making her name. But yeah, um, and she passed away, sadly, mm. in 2015 from uh, pancreatic cancer. Oh. So, you know, she's great in just this little bit. Mm -hmm. And even the news anchor is great because that's, that's an L.A. news anchor, right? Totally. <laughs> so perfect. So you're right, Steve. Quickly, we have a relationship developed between the program manager and William Atherton's character. The, you know, he, this guy, he's constantly hassling him to try to get, to, you know, a truck or try to get something to chase some crazy news story down. And the guy doesn't want to do it. 
and then you see the news anchor is like give give us a break way harry or whatever he says and he pushes back at him and says stick a sock at it so clearly there's a division here between the two guys with the anchor versus the guy who's actually out there covering the news versus the guy who's reading the news which is the natural division that happens so all of it works so well and she's just like look i just want to do the news show yeah. man can we focus on this so it's great all of which is completely unnecessary yeah. in terms of Die Hard and does this thing that happens throughout the movie, which is there are no wasted characters. Right. Even though we only see these guys for a couple of seconds, there is a conflict. They're fully developed. They're interesting. The moments are mm -hmm. funny. And let me tell you how some of this came about. Bruce Willis in the first couple of weeks of shooting was still doing moonlighting. Oh, so he was like we talked about with Michael J. Fox on Back to the Future. He was doing moonlighting during the day and right. then coming to shoot Die Hard at night, mm -hmm. which sounds even more brutal than Back to the right. Future, you know, because this is a lot of physical stuff. Yeah. And so what McTiernan said, he's like, look, we got to fill some time. Why don't you fill out the, the supporting characters and give them little bits? Mm -hmm. And that way we have little things to shoot when we don't have Bruce Willis on the set. Right. And so that's where all of these little moments between the supporting characters that are so great are yeah. just a couple of extra lines that Steven D'Souza filled them out with while we're waiting for Bruce Willis. And like I said, there was no reason for it. And in a lesser yeah. movie, you'd have him go, can I get a news fan? And he goes, yeah, take fan number three. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you would be done faster. And nothing that has anything to do with John McClane or the terrorists would be any different. Right. Wouldn't affect the story in the slightest. And taking the extra... 25 seconds to make it a conflict makes all these people real people, you know? Yeah, and we understand that William Matherton's character is an aggressive SOB. So yeah. when it happens later on, we've already got a little bit of foundation to go from with that, yeah. He wasn't lying about Marco. He's down on the street. And the other man was Heinrich. And his bag is missing. And this is the first time we see a crack in Hans's armor. He had to detonate it detonators so good so good here is a line i've said many many times as a director hans calls down to theo and asks how's it going theo says three down four to go and hans says don't waste time talking to me i cannot tell you how many times on the set i've checked in with someone is like how's it going with this and they said and i said then don't waste time talking to me i've used that <laughs> all the time <laughs> that's great this is sergeant al powell of the los angeles police department if the person who radioed for help can hear me on this channel, acknowledge this transmission. And of course, one of the things we see is that Hans is hearing him call up. You the guy in the car? What's left of him. Can you identify yourself? Not now. Maybe later. Listen fast. This is a party line. The neighbor's got itchy trigger fingers. And then he gives a description. And from everything he says, it makes it so clear that he is a cop. Well, He's telling them everything. Let him. I'm waiting for the FBI to arrive until then. He can waste as much time as he likes. There's a moment as he's describing what the terrorist has and he talks about their automatic weapons, explosives, et cetera, mm -hmm. where he is walking through. I think he's in the computer room now and there's a pause and he stops talking and the camera moves in on him from behind and he turns. Mm -hmm. That moment creates a feeling that he might be watched or that he's feeling like there might be someone there. Right. And that is a once they start doing that, you'll see this happen a lot, which is the camera moving in a not natural way that gives you a sense that John McClane is not alone. Add all that up. I don't know what the fuck it means, but you got some badass perpetrators and they're here to stay. <laughs> Great connections. And Al asks what he can call him, and there's a pause, and he says, Call me Roy. <laughs> I can remember being in the theater when he says, call me Roy mm. after the BK motherfucker scene and just going, this movie is so good. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's great. By the way, these two sides of the conversation of John McClane on the radio and Al on the radio yeah. sh shot four months apart. Wow. And, and I don't know how they did, did it on this, but in general, you don't call an actor in if they're not going to appear on camera on the set. So mm -hmm. they don't call in Reginald Van Johnson in order to just hang out while Bruce Willis no, does right. this scene. And, and, yeah. and, they, and they don't call in Bruce Willis to come. I mean, Bruce Willis is almost never on that exterior set except for the final very end of the film. Yeah. And so the, the odds are that the script supervisor is reading the other side, side of the lines. And that's true in this scene. Mm -hmm. It's true in the bathroom scenes. Right. And I don't know this. It's certainly possible that the actors showed up for each other, but right. the fact is they were probably giving this performance with someone who's not a very good actor because 
the script supervisors are amazing people, mm. but they're usually not as good actors as professional <laughs> actors. And yet these scenes feel so real and so connected every time they're on the radio together. And up comes more car, cop cars, a big truck, and then an unmarked car comes out. And out of the unmarked car comes Paul Gleason, Dwayne <laughs> Robinson, our other great 80s asshole. Dwayne Robinson, pal, what's the deal here? What do these pricks want? This movie does this amazing thing of taking people. They're the awesome people, which yeah. are John McClane, but also Hans and Carl and some of the terrorists mm -hmm. and Al and the horrible people which are Ellis and William Atherton and Dwayne Robinson that are just terrible. Mm -hmm. And they're, and they're on both sides because, you know, yeah. theoretically the cops are the good guys, but Dwayne Robinson is definitely not a good guy. No. Um, and he immediately doesn't believe Al. In fact, I think he's a cop. Maybe not LAPD, but he's definitely a badge. How do you know that? A hunch. Things he said, like being able to spot a phony ID. Jesus Christ, pal. Give me a fucking bartender for all we know. Again, it's this idea of everybody in charge is incompetent. Mm. Bruce Willis is the guy on the ground, the flat foot. He's the guy there. He's the every man. So these other higher ups who could help him in this situation all have to be incompetent uh, or not good at their jobs so that he stands out. So it's. It's deft writing, but it's very difficult to pull off and not turn mm. the film into a caricature uh, overall, a caricature piece overall. But the casting correctly is so important. And these actors bringing a certain kind of life to their back and forth. And I think it also helped that Dwayne had been a dick in Breakfast Club. So, right. you know, you kind of go training in places and yeah. training places, right? You already go in with a with a mindset. So maybe that was a little bit of shortcut casting where they know, well, the audience isn't going to like this guy or William Atherton from Ghostbusters. They're both immediately going to be assholes in the audience's mind. So we don't have to work that hard to turn them into a-holes uh, and they'll do all the work for us. So it's it's great. It's smart. And again, you know, just because we mentioned it many times, the casting director is Jackie Birch, and yeah. he does just this incredible job. Um, I yeah, I I totally agree, and it cre and it also because it gives a conflict for Al is yes. that it gives something for him to push against, and if he didn't have something for him to push against, all of the scenes down with the cops would be less interesting. He would just be relaying information to John. Right. By the way, one of the things they did is they shot a lot of long lenses and shallow depth of field for all the exterior stuff. So even though we're outside, mm. it feels kind of claustrophobic because yeah. all space is really compressed, mm -hmm. even though we're probably, you know, it's open space, we're outside. Right, right. Holly goes to talk to Hans. <laughs> Again, it's a great, I know I keep saying it. I, f I feel a little bit like, um, uh, what's his name? Chris Farley. Remember oh. that moment? It was so, that, <laughs> when she said that line, wasn't that great? <laughs> but it is great when she comes in and Han says, what idiot put you in charge? You did when you murdered my boss. <laughs> Bonnie Bedelia's performance is great. Yeah. And, and one of the things I don't quite know how to say this in the right way, okay. which is she's a beautiful woman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But one of the things that's so great about the way she plays the part, the way they dress her, the way they did her hair is that so often in action films, particularly action films of the 80s, yeah. is that the love interest was a hot young girl. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Bonnie Bedelia is a woman, you right. know, like right. she is a mature, not that I'm saying, I'm not saying she looks old or anything like that. No, I'm no. saying that she has so much strength and so much life experience. And so the love interest is someone of part of a mature relationship. It's not the hot girl yeah. that the hero is trying to save, you know? Right. Well, that hasn't changed in 2021, yeah. man. So you still see it. But yes, you're right. She's, she's, a, 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 she's a age appropriate for Bruce Willis, which is rare in Hollywood. Yep. Um, she has two kids. Mm-hmm. She works for this high-profile uh, Japanese businessman uh, or business corporation. So she's already has these credentials of being a very strong, determined person. Mm -hmm. And we see her have the back and forth with John. She does give an inch, right? right? And you're right. In other '80s films, maybe the woman like gives an inch because of the way it's written uh, and what. Even they turned Kim Basinger into a screaming uh, need a person who needs to be rescued all the time in the Batman movie. Mm. In this, Bonnie Bedelia is very steely throughout yeah. the whole movie, and it's essential because. It could easily have been 
damsel in distress sitting on the sidelines waiting for her man to go do everything. But they give her these scenes where you see her show her strength, her resolve. And I'm sure Bonnie was like, I'm not taking this fucking role until you make this thing yeah. a little bit more. Because she's she was at the time one of these women that was out there pushing for these stronger roles. I think she played the first female star car driver in a film in a biopic earlier in her career in the 80s. So this is a woman who's no stranger to bringing strong, powerful female characters to the screen. So that movie is Heart Like a Wheel. Heart Like a Wheel. That's and, it, yes. And that is what Bruce Willis saw her in. And Bonnie Bedelia is Bruce Willis's idea. <laughs> he said you should get her to play Holly. Smart. Yeah. Smart. Um, it really is, man. Mm -hmm. it, it's funny having heard stories about the Bruce Willis of the last 20 years. And yeah. How demanding and difficult I've heard that he can be on set. Yeah. It doesn't sound like that was who Bruce Willis was at all in 1988. Of course, when you're young, you're different. When you're yeah. older, things change. You yeah. get grizzled by the business, man. Yeah. And I love that not only has Holly earned my respect in the moment of saying, you know, you did when you murdered my boss, she earns Hans's respect. Yeah. Right away. Mm -hmm. And we hear about, you know, getting the pregnant woman off the, the rocks that she's sitting on, that people need pee breaks. And, he, and Hans is really like, okay, I will do yeah. what you said. I like she says, can we bring her to the office? He's like, no, but I'll have a couch brought out to her. Yeah. So he immediately, he changes his tact because he wasn't even looking at her. Then when she, she shot back at him, it, there was a level, there's a level of respect by the time she walks out that door. Well, and this is the scene that makes me debate whether or not Hans is a full sociopath. Because mm. like he, the, it does seem as if he is caring not caring obviously he's a horrible evil bad guy yes but like he's going yeah you're right i i, I should get that pregnant woman off the rocks and yes yeah. people do need to go use the bathroom right it, so it's yeah. it's i kind of go like i wonder who hans is outside mm -hmm. of this sequence it's a good question and then there's again it's just really subtle acting and really subtle filmmaking where holly's eyes kind of flick to that photograph that's face down on yeah. the desk oh my god and hans notices that there's something going on doesn't know quite what it is and asks if there's something else and she gets herself together and says no thank you mm -hmm. and he says what's your name mrs and she turns and she turns standing right next to the door miss Gennaro. <laughs> and again these are the plants and payoffs and that, that and now we've and what's so cool about it is we've taken a conflict between two characters and the conflict yeah. is manifest itself in the the name using the maiden name which is on the door and was on the computer right. and the photograph, which she put face down because she was pissed off at John. Yeah. And now those two things have become plot points in terms of keeping Hans from knowing who she is and who John McClane is. Yeah. Great that, payoffs, man. It's great. Um, Argyle pouring himself a drink, <laughs> hanging out in his limo and I love that he's got the little bottle of booze and he's poured the little bottle of the booze and then he hears on the TV. Approximately two hours ago, an unidentified group of men seized control of the Nakatomi building, sealing off all entrances and exits. <laughs> and that instead of drinking out of the glass that he just poured, he drinks out of the bottle. Um, and he hears something about CB communication, grabs his CB, turns it on and hears cops moving into position. Yeah. Again, all the storytelling is great. We have SWAT running in on like some scaffolding and that's because there actually was a construction site across the street so they just said hey can we use this um which was lucky for them there and try and draw some what's going on what's it look like we're going in and this is nuts yeah. i mean it absolutely both the the woman on the emergency radio and sending in swat when you have no idea what's going on is yeah. absolutely ridiculous no police department would ever do this but you have to make it look that way so that bruce willis stands out even more excuse me sir but what about the body that fell out the window? Well, who knows? It's probably some stockbroker got depressed. That's ridiculous. I know. That's the line of the movie where I'm like, you should have cut that. Because it doesn't, no police captain worth his salt or detect, whatever he is, would, or chief of detect, whatever he is, would say that out loud. None. I mean, it's not like people didn't sue the LAPD back in the 80s. There's no way you could, you would get away with that, so... But, you know, it's to turn him into a, an incompetent a-hole. That's why yeah. they do it. And it's certainly not that uh, there aren't incompetent a-holes in positions of oh, power. Of all course. Over. Yeah. Yeah, of course. This one is particularly egregious. Yeah. yeah. 
and they say hit the lights and we put on these big huge spotlights and of course john sees the big huge spotlights al you still with me babe what's going on if you are what i think you are then you'll know when to listen when to shut up and and when to pray i love john's reaction here yeah because he cares about other cops mm -hmm. like that's what his reaction is is you're, you're gonna say even though it's the lapd and i'm nypd you're sending guys in to get killed Christ, pal, I told you what kind of people you're dealing with here. All right, let's load them up. And Hans, very confidently, says, They'll be coming. Everyone get ready. Here, you are the eyes now. And Eddie, who's the Huey Lewis guy, closes all the gates. All these things that we saw at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And SWAT starts to move in. Argyle is driving through the garage trying to find a way out. And then we have this moment that you mentioned mm -hmm. of the rose bush. Oh. <laughs> Boy, that it's right on the edge. It is. It's yeah. stupid. It's, it's stupid. Yeah. I laughed at it when I, I'm sure I laughed at it when I first saw it. And now oh, I sure. kind of wish it wasn't there. Right. Right. But it is this mix of comedy and drama. And by the way, the music that is SWAT's leitmotif is the other one we talked about from Clockwork Orange, which is Singing in the Rain. That is what the music is here. In fact, Theo is actually humming, singing in the rain mm -hmm. while this is going on. I don't think we've mentioned that Al Leong is one of our terrorists. <laughs> Al Leong, who we've seen in three films, he's in Die Hard. He tortures Mel Gibson in Lethal Weapon, and yeah. he's in Big Trouble in Little China. And this is, of course, the long-haired Chinese actor, really well-known stuntman. And he was just one of these, for me, as particularly a guy who loved martial arts movies, was this unbelievably recognizable person of the late 80s. Right. You know? Yes. And he, but he, and he's Genghis Khan in um, Bill and Ted. <laughs> That's right. That's um, right. And he is taking a defensive position behind a glass case, which is really, John. You served in the military. I yeah. don't know if they ever discussed if you had to defend like a store or something, mm -hmm. but generally taking cover behind glass. Yeah, it doesn't is, make sense. That's no. not really very smart. No, but. It gives but. us one of the best moments, which is just, he looks dead. He's got his weapon. He's looking at it, you know, pe where people can come in. Then he looks down. Yeah. He looks down again, sees a candy bar, <laughs> and grabs a Nestle's Crunch. That's a great 80s moment. I love it. It is. That one works. The totally. The on the SWAT guy, that doesn't work. That works. Well, the difference is, is that. It's a human moment. Particularly, you know, I will say the way that the SWAT guy hit in the rose bush is filmed does not look like it would have hurt him. That's right. not how thorns hurt you when you're moving through a plant. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like he wouldn't have that reaction. Whereas a terrorist who at the moment before battle suddenly goes, I want a candy bar. It's just funny. And it's a great way to do product. Please. Yep. Yeah. Um, Argyle has now determined he can't get out. He turns off his car and looks and in his rear view mirror is John McClane's bear. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> SWAT is moving in, and now we get Theo's description. It was the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring except the four assholes coming in the rear in standard two by two cover formation. I think this is the highlight of Theo in the whole movie. Is him totally. Doing I mean, his play by play here is great. You know, oh, the police have themselves an RV, and the quarterback is toast. Those little things. As you said, Steve, every one of these characters gets their moment to ha mm -hmm. to shine in the movie. And this is a great, because this could have easily been uh, um, uh, Hans just conducting right. orders. And so the fact that he let Theo mm. be the eyes and the ears or the way it was written to let uh, Theo be the eyes and the ears is is smart, is very smart. Well, that's a, that's a great point I hadn't thought about until you just said it, is that, yeah. you know, time in a movie and dialogue is a zero sum game, which means that anything you give to somebody is something you took away from somewhere else. Yeah. You yeah. know, and so frequently in movies, you'll hear stories of the star saying, why is that guy getting the funny line? Right, I would like right. to have the funny line. In this movie, there's so much giving moments given away to supporting characters. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what makes it great. And, and, and I totally, because I think this, the whole Night Before Christmas line does multiple things. One is, it's just doing the job, which is you could have just said, all right, we have you know, four SWAT people, they're moving in 2.2 cover formation, whatever mm -hmm. that is, yeah. in standard heading towards the rear. We could do that and mm -hmm. all the information would be conveyed. Doing it this way goes, A, of course, Theo has a sense of humor, but it makes it 
suddenly you go, man, Theo knows something. He must yeah. have, he must be trained. He must have military training right. or he, all of that comes through. And that this is not his first rodeo. Yeah. He's having fun with this because right. he knows they're going to win. Yeah. Yeah. And as opposed to Dwayne Robinson, which when they say they're in position, his order is <laughs> kick ass. Yeah. It's just so terrible. It, there, there's Ugh. so much machismo. Yes. I'm kind of wondering is the deputy some in some places, the chief of police is an elected official. Mm hmm. Uh, and I don't know if the deputy chief of police in Los Angeles is an elected official. I think probably not. Mm -hmm. um, but there, I don't think that Dwayne Robinson was ever a cop on the street. Oh, good question. Oh, wow. Well, may, I, I don't know if I maybe, but may, if he was, he was one of those cops on the street, yeah. if you know what I mean. I do yeah. know what you mean. He immediately comes in. He undervalues the black cop who's there. He undervalues him completely. He takes over the situation, doesn't give him any kind of agency in this situation, then immediately sends in his boys to get their asses shot um, when a, a little more um, humility in the situation is called for than what he did, does. Yeah. So, yeah, I can see that. The SWAT guys are trying to pick the lock and then... The terrorists open fire, and the SWAT head of SWAT goes, oh, it's panic fire. They can't see anything. They're shooting at the light. <laughs> oh, and then the lights start blowing up. And then <laughs> Dwayne, as if he figured this out himself, goes, they're going after the lights. <laughs> and Al just burying his head in his hands. It's just, it's we're writing this comedy <laughs> drama thing so well in this yeah. movie. Yeah. Okay. Now they're trying to blowtorch the door open and all we know all the terrorists are just sitting there with their weapons ready to open fire. Al's on his second candy bar. I don't quite know what it is. <laughs> and they still haven't broken through and so now the SWAT guy goes, "Send in the car. Send in the car." This is the the note I wrote down when he says send in the car is I think that SWAT guy has an erection. <laughs> at this moment. Sure. Um and now we open fire yeah. and just, and, and Han says to just wound them, which mm -hmm. is brutal in itself. And they're sitting got ducks. They're sitting in front of a glass door. They can't see anything inside and they just get wiped out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, the uh, tank is a World War II armored car. It's a Scorpion, which is a small British tank, Ooh. which is not anything like the, <laughs> the current RVs. Right. Right. Um, and, because the the RV is coming to the southeast corner, we have our guys with rocket launchers pushing this cart through. They go into the elevator. John is getting really, really upset. He sees the ele a light go by as the elevator goes down, which I don't think you've ever seen ever in a building. Yeah. You know, a light that's you can see because the elevator is going past, but it works really well for this. Mm -hmm. They push the cart. They drop one shell, which is important as they're pushing the cart forward. They grab this cool tripod that show, it's like explosive bolts or something <laughs> to go into the ground. That is John McTiernan's idea. Oh, OK. And again, it's the here's another little cool thing. Like yeah. how many times are like that's a little cool thing. That's a little yep. cool thing. That's what makes it a great movie. It's all these little things. The tank going up the stairs apparently was months of negotiation Ooh, to wow. get this. The, this is a brand new building. Yeah. Those stairs are imported marble from Spain. The railing is a like beautiful art artistically um, specifically made for this thing out of stainless steel. Yeah. And Fox was like, you cannot hurt these steps. And they're like, no, <laughs> we're not going to hurt the steps. It'll be fine. We're just driving a tank and having a bunch of explosions. They pulled out the railing that's actually there and they put in their own railing for it to yeah. dest destroy just to protect that. But then they also ordered a bunch of marble from Spain from the same places, just in case they had to rebuild all the stairs. And the plan was if we mess up the stairs, we're just going to rebuild them in the middle of the night. So nobody knows <laughs> that was the plan. Well, did they mess up the stairs or not? No, apparently oh. they didn't. Um, I mean, they destroyed the railing, but that was a, that was a fake. Right. Um, right. Apparently they didn't mess up the stairs. And what, but what's crazy about this is that, is that this is a Fox picture the building is owned by Fox. Yeah. And yet they still, and this happens in movies all the time where they have to negotiate within a company to make right. a deal. So one part of the company will pay another part of the company. Yeah. A lot of red tapes, Steve. Yeah. 
Uh, that's why I've, I've chosen never to make a big studio. Movie, John. <laughs> I just didn't Very want smart. the red tape. It's of course. Much to deal with. Um, and they open fire and they blow the, they blow the tank up. Oh my God, the quarterback is toast. The way they did it, by the way, is that the missile is on a piano wire that goes from oh, the building. Yeah. And so that's how it goes down. And it's going much slower than an actual missile would go. Right, right. And then Han says, hit it again. Oh, this is great. Yeah. This is Han's turning the tables a little bit on McLean because McLean is mad. He's rattled John now by mm-hmm. saying hit it again. Is Hans, you son of a bitch, you made your point. Let them run with I appreciate it. I'll take it under advice, but hit it again. You know, it's so it's great to see him kind of push back on McLean a little bit. Well, and I think for Hans, this is all he wants them to look really, really dangerous because he wants the FBI to show up. Right. You know, that's his goal. Yeah, pushing it. Um by the way, do you recognize the guy who's shooting the missiles? The the mm-hmm. Vico the Carpathian? Do you recognize him? No. That's him from Ghostbusters 2, oh who's in God. the portrait. Of yeah. course it is. Now that now I can totally picture it. So <laughs> uh that's hilarious. John grabs he breaks the glass to get an axe. He starts hitting the elevator. But he's mad. He's oh, mad. Yeah. This would not have happened if Hans hadn't shot at yep. the the, the, the tank again. So he's like slamming the ax into the door. He's coming up with this idea. And in his in his rage and a little bit of you know, brains too, uh, he attaches the explosives and the detonators to this rolling chair and puts a, a massive computer monitor from the 80s on top for quote unquote stability. So <laughs> I, it's it's a nutty idea. It is. And what I, what I, I know that like when we did Lawrence of Arabia, and they had detonators yeah. and plastic explosives-ish, I think, in 1917 or whatever year that is. Yeah. And Farage or Davoud or whichever one it is puts the detonator on against his skin and he falls and it blows up and kills yeah. him. Yeah. And so like, I go like, do detonators just work from impact in 1988? Because that seems to be the implication. Yeah. But he pushes it down the thing. And what gives him the time to do that is that the terrorists have to go back down the hallway to get the missile that they dropped off the cart earlier. Right. You know, and so it's like just and and this is all again, it's all the little things. The Mm -hmm. fact that they're rushing so much that they drop a missile makes the moment of them rushing to the window more interesting. Yeah. And it also creates the space for John to do the thing with the monitor and the C4. And then there is a huge explosion, which in 1988. I feel like this is the biggest explosion I had ever seen. Yeah, it was pretty massive. Agreed. It's apparently a lot of it is flash bulbs in the building. So it makes the bright light and there's a lot of smoke. And then they're also using a model. So it's, it's, it's not actually as big an explosion as we think it is, but it sure looked big when we saw it. And then the, then John is looking down the elevator shaft and up comes a, a wall of flame. And if that's 30 stories, I think this building's in deep trouble if it's that big an explosion. Um, but, but this is genius, isn't it? Once again, and we'll praise the movie till the end of the show. So y'all should, till the end of all three parts of this, but y'all, so y'all should be prepared for that. But this is once again, a very smart script. You have this moment of anger, uh, from McLean, and you're now connected to McLean. You sympathize with McLean. So him making this move, you may not be 100% behind it, but you understand the impetus. But John is doing this in a moment of rage, a moment of frustration and yep. anger. He's not thinking this through. So when you see the explosion, it's incredible um, and certainly eye-popping, but the flames coming back up once again, puts McLean in deficit, yes, right? Yes. It makes him back. It pushes him back from almost taking over the situation and getting getting one over on Hans. He puts himself in a position where he could um, he almost gets uh, killed himself. Yeah. Well, and I also think this is the moment where Hans suddenly is taking John McLean seriously yes, in a way true. that he wasn't before. Yeah. I mean, he knew he was a threat, but now he goes, "Idiot! It's not the police." It's him. It's him. Yeah. And I lo- and the moment, too, of, with, again, with a huge lens flare, we're pushing in on William Atherton and his camera crew. And then he turns to them and says, Tell me you got that. I got it. I got it. Hit your heart on Channel 5. <laughs> a plant. That's great. Yeah, exactly. It's another plant. What was that? Remember that plastic explosive I told you about? Yeah. 
There you go. <laughs> and again, the jokes are all great. Is the building on fire? No, but it's gonna need a paint job and a shitload of screen doors. <laughs> all, all the joking between John and Al is great. Yeah, cop talk, man. But then Dwayne Robinson grabs the radio and says, now you listen to me, mister. I don't know who the hell you think you are or what you're doing, but you just destroyed a building. I've got 100 people down here and they're covered with glass. Glass? <laughs> Which, by the way, glass will kill you. Oh, <laughs> like that, sure. Like, but like <laughs> from that far away, it's not that much glass. And Dwayne is lying. And, and again, it's connecting it to other people because Dwayne tries to calls John an asshole, and John goes, asshole? I'm not the one who just got butt-fucked on national TV, Dwayne. Dwayne. And who do we cut to then is Argyle right. listening in, and it's keeping his character alive. The mm -hmm. moment is funny, and it also teaches us that Argyle is now paying attention to everything that's going on over CB. Right. So right. it's doing all this work. Now you listen to me, jerk off. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Quit being part of the fucking problem and put the other guy back on. We're now at another line that I've said many times. Hey, Roy, how you feeling? Pretty fucking unappreciated, Al. <laughs> There's, I, I'm yeah. sure you have too. There have been many times in my life where I've felt pretty fucking unappreciated. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and then I think this is the first time that John calls Al partner. Mm -hmm. And I think all of the things that are not replicable when you do a sequel to Die Hard is like you can only build this friendship once. Yeah. You know what right. I mean? Mm -hmm. And you can't do it again and have him build another friendship with some other, you know, it's like, right. We did this. And this is the difference between John McClane and James Bond. James Bond's going to have lots of missions. Mm -hmm. John McClane, the whole thing that makes Die Hard work is that this is just this ordinary guy. Yeah. And this is what happens to him on this one crazy night. Mm -hmm. When he has four or five crazy experiences like this, it's like, well, then he's not an ordinary guy anymore. Right. Which is what the franchise is lost in that last one for sure. I mean, him, you know, <laughs> jumping on top of a jet, uh, all of that was like, it's all kind of, it's crazy and whatever, but yeah, that's what you lose. And that's the same thing with the Fast and Furious franchise. I mean, that first film, they're stealing DVD players. Now they're <laughs> out in space for fuck's sake. So, you know, I've never seen a Fast and Furious movie. <laughs> Ooh, Ooh <laughs> smells like a cinephile's them. live to yeah, me. Yeah, maybe. It smells like a cinephile's live to me. Um, All right. You know what I always do when I am a hostage in a terrorist situation? Oh, yes, please. I snort some coke. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Gotta Let's get courage. Go. Yeah. And, and Alice is now going to talk to them. <laughs> what are you going to do? Hey, babe, I negotiate million dollar deals for breakfast. I think I can handle this Euro trash. And then I love the line. Frequency talk, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I like that he adjusts his tie like that's going to make a fucking difference. If you listen to me, he would be neutralized already. I don't want neutral. I want dead. And then there is Ellis. <laughs> what does he want? It's not what I want. It's what I can give you. Everything this guy does, Hart Buckner does in this scene is amazing. Yeah. And then we have one of these triangle shots. Which is that oh, yeah. the shot goes from Ellis to Carl holding the gun up to Carl's face, and Hans gives him a gesture of like of no. It's obvious you're not some dumb schmuck up here to snatch a few purses, am I right? You're very perceptive. I watch 60 minutes. I say to myself, these guys are professional, they're motivated, they're happening, i.e., they want something, huh? Now, personally, I couldn't care less about your politics. <laughs> and then he just just goes on a completely racist rant maybe you're pissed off at the camel jockeys maybe it's the heaves northern island it's none of my business i figure you're here to negotiate am i right you're amazing you figured this all out already what's so great about the scene is that we're having fun being with hans yeah watching this moron do this thing and the reason is because they've built up hans in such a positive way through the whole movie and by that i mean He's, he's someone to be feared. He's actually someone who respects a situation. He's not a hothead. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when Ellis comes in, somehow we're on Hans' side in this situation. Well, and Hans, f for most of the film, is actually having fun. Yes. He he's playing with Takagi. He's right. playing. He's making these speeches. He's messing with people. Yep. He, he, he makes, you know, insults John McClane. He thinks he's got it all figured out, and it's kind of fun to be with him. Yeah. And then Ellis goes, he translates uh, what Hans is doing into business speech. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And these are all business terms. You're here in a hostile takeover. You grab us for some green mail, but you didn't expect some poison pill was going to be running around in the building. Am I right? Hans, Bobby, I'm your white knight. And then this moment he says, I must have missed 60 minutes. What are you saying? And I love that Ellis says, he says, the guy upstairs is fucking things up. And then he touches Carl. Mm -hmm. Which Great. is like, he really shouldn't touch Carl at yeah. that moment. But it's all connected here. The guy upstairs is fucking things up, huh? I can give him to you. And then that big, huge smile. Oh, no, you could shove three a classic 80s assholes in one movie. Like, yeah. that's incredible. And they're all different. Yes, they're they different, are. Different varieties. They're different flavored assholes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe I should cut flavored assholes out of the show. <laughs> Hello. Oh, God. Uh, Roy, are you all right? I was trying to fire down a thousand year old Twinkie. What did I put in these cigs anyway? It's when Al reads the ingredients that I go, I don't think is what he, he I think he eats all the Twinkies. Polysorbate 80. <laughs> Yellow dye number five. <laughs> I'll tell you this. This is no lie. That scene and that line started me the process of reading ingredients in food. And I really? did not do that until this movie. So um, I had no idea to look for chemicals in my food. I was just like, it tastes good. I'm going to eat it. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely was because growing up in the 70s in mm. Marin County, which was the land of hippies and natural <laughs> food. No, we, we, we were taught about ingredients. Real, I was real yeah. young. There yeah. was not those kinds of stuff in my house most of the time. Like there was no sugar cereal in my house. There was, it was, wow. yeah, it was very sad, sad, sad. I'm upbringing. sorry, but sad, sad, sad. Yeah. It's funny. I was just watching a CrossFit documentary for a review I'm going to do on the channel. And one of the women who trains, uh, she's in the top five of the world. And she's one of the top American, if not the top American CrossFitter. She has chicken breasts and family sized Lucky Charms in her training bag. Sugar and cereal, ladies and gentlemen. It can get you into shape. All okay. Right, <laughs> Good to know. You heard it here first. <laughs> um, there are going to be all these people. It's like, the cinephiles made me put on 30 pounds. <laughs> yeah, because you didn't work out. You're also <laughs> supposed to work out. <laughs> Do you remember the um, old Saturday Night Live commercial of John Belushi winning oh, the decathlon? Yes. yes, with the chocolate donuts. <laughs> I logged a lot of miles training for that day. And I downed a lot of donuts, little chocolate donuts. They taste good, and they've got the sugar I need to get me going in the morning. That's why little chocolate donuts have been on my training table since I was a kid. <laughs> As he's smoking cigarettes. <laughs> oh, oh, brilliant. It's, it's the best. <laughs> and what the Twinkies lead us into is a talk about kids. Yeah. How many kids you got, Al? Huh? Well, as a matter of fact, my wife is working on our first. How about you, cowboy? You got any kids back on your ranch? Yeah, two. Sure hope I can see him swinging on a jungle gym with Al Jr. someday. And then their conversation is broken into by Hans, who says, touching, cowboy, touching. Or should I call you Mr. McLean? Mr. Officer John McLean of the New York Police Department. And again, we touch in with our other characters, which is the reporter gets the name and now it's like, okay, go do that research. Mm -hmm. And I think at this moment, he knows my name. That means he's probably found my wife. That's what John is yeah, thinking. Yeah, probably, yes. Sister Teresa called me Mr. McLean in the third grade. My friends call me John. You're neither shithead. But he's got to him. Oh, yeah. That response, he's got to McLean. Yeah. yeah. And he says, I have someone who wants to talk to you, a very special friend who was with you at the party tonight. Mm -hmm. And in this moment, John knows that it's his wife. Right. You know, and then we hear Ellis's voice. <laughs> I know you think you're doing your job, John, and I can appreciate that, but you're just dragging this thing out. Now look, no one gets out of here until these guys can talk to the L.A. police. And that just ain't going to happen until you stop messing up the works. Capisce? I think I pointed this out in the when we did the show before, but basic screen, screen convention is that if you're shooting a conversation in the same room, you'll have one character who tends to be on the left of frame looking towards mm -hmm. the right and another character on the right of frame looking towards the left. And as you cut between them, that gives you the illusion that they are looking at each other. Mm -hmm. And because I could easily shoot it where both characters are on the left side of frame looking right, that's called crossing the line. And it means that they don't look like they're looking at each other, even right. though they were really looking at each other on set. 
Yeah. When you're shooting a phone call or a radio call in this case, you keep the same conventions so that that when he's talking to Hans, Hans is looking from the left towards the right. Mm -hmm. And John McClane, who was shot on a different day in a different location, is looking right to left. And what's interesting that McTiernan does that's so brilliant, which is that when Hans hands the radio to Ellis, mm -hmm. Ellis is now looking the same direction that John McClane was. So if you if John didn't move or the camera didn't move, they would not look like they were talking to each other, even though they're not in the same room. And there's no reason that they would be facing towards each other. Right. It makes the conversation feel more real when they're looking towards each other. So. Mm -hmm. John moves and there's a camera move at the same moment that Hans hands the radio to Ellis so that now Ellis is looking right to left and John is looking left to right. Oh, interesting. And okay. so and, the, and what's so amazing about that to me is that that takes planning weeks right. apart. They had to know, OK, which direction was he looking and where was the camera so that we can match it when we shoot the other side of the conversation later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Ellis is supremely confident oh yeah he's got the confidence that only comes with cocaine <laughs> um, not the eradicating that and the one thing that ellis does do well is that he tells john essentially mm -hmm. i didn't tell them about holly i told him we were old friends and you were my guest at the party right right that is the one thing that ellis does well yep so at some base level he does understand that it would be dangerous for them to have this. Interview. Yes. So, yeah. Bruce Willis's layers of his performance in the scene are so great. Oh, yeah. Because he can't say too much, but he's trying to get Ellis to make a different choice. Like yes. trying to warn him that you are going to die, that you right. don't understand the situation you're in. I love that they deliver a Coca-Cola to the guy on Coke <laughs> And pour the drink for him. And, and, and I love it because I, 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 it's, it's what happens in the meeting. Like I've gone mm -hmm. to the pitch meeting where whoever the executive's assistant was mm -hmm. brought in a Coke for me or water <laughs> or whatever. That's just like, an, and so they're pouring in the Coke mm -hmm. and Ellis says, They want the detonators or they're going to kill me. And then smiles and gives Hans a thumbs up <laughs> because he thinks he's doing a performance. Do you think at any point, Ellis is worried that, or Ellis is grasping that he's bitten off more than he can chew be, uh, in a cocaine haze. Because as this conversation progresses, there's a growing frustration in Ellis towards McLean, obviously. But also, I think there's little hints of him sus um, suspecting that if this doesn't go well, they're going to kill him. Uh, and in this moment here, when he's having this particular back and forth is the beginning of that in my mind, judging from Hart Bachner's face. I think it's re to me, it's really clear is yep. that I think he has no sense that he could get killed. OK, until the moment where John says, shut up, Ellis, just shut your mouth. Put Hans back on the line. Ellis hands the radio back to Hans or is holding it out for him. Yeah. And the camera goes from, it pans from Ellis to Hans. And what we see is that Hans has pulled out his gun. Yes. And it is that moment that Ellis sees Hans pulling out his gun. And Hans, by the way, doesn't argue with John when John no. says, I know what kind of person you are. Right. Hans says, Good, then you'll give us what we want and save your friend's life. And the camera tracks behind Ellis and rises up as Hans is holding that gun. And he says, what am I, a method actor, Hans? <laughs> Babe, put away the gun. This is radio, not television. <laughs> Bruce Willis is so good at desperately, desperately trying to save Ellis's life in this moment. Yeah. Hans, this asshole is not my friend. I just met him tonight. I don't know him. Jesus Christ, Ellis, these people are going to kill you. Tell them you don't know me. And there's even feels like there's a moment where Ellis could maybe talk his way out. Maybe. I don't actually think he could. Right. But Ellis doubles down. He says, <laughs> John, how can you say that after all these years, huh? <laughs> John. John. He takes a little sip of his Coke. And this is the moment I think that Ellis is like, knows. Yeah. And do we see the gunshot happen with Ellis? No, we hear it with John. Which is a great way to do it. Yeah. We don't need to see another person getting shot yep. in the head. 
So, yeah. And then everyone starts screaming and Hans runs outside with the radio so that John can hear the screams. Talk to me. Where are my detonators? Where are they? Or shall I shoot another one? Sooner or later, I might get to someone you do care about. Go fuck yourself, Hans. And of course, the police were listening in on Ellis's murder. Hmm. And Dwayne thinks it's John McClane's fault. Did you hear that? He just let the guy die, man. He just gave him up. Give me that headset. And now he has a big argument with Al Powell. Can't you see what's happening? Can't That's you cold. read between the lines? It's on the right channel? Yes, sir. He did everything he could to save him. If he gave himself up, they'd both be dead oh, right now. No way, man. No way. They'd be talking to us. It is ridiculous. I actually, I agree. We're, Dwayne Robinson is completely ridiculous. Yeah. That he's he's just, all he wants to do is nail John McClane's ass. He doesn't even care about the terrorists. And, and clearly... Mm -hmm. John McClane wasn't lying. Clearly, there are terrorists, and a whole bunch of SWAT guys got killed yeah. because of it, you know? The man is hurting. He is alone, tired, and he hasn't seen diddly squat from anybody down here. Now, you're gonna stand there and tell me that he's gonna give a damn about what you do to him if he makes it out of there alive? Why don't you wake up and smell what you're shoveling? You listen to me, Sergeant. Anytime you wanna go home, you consider yourself dismissed. No, sir. You couldn't drag me away. By the way, one thing I noticed this time, I don't think Al Powell swears. No. I think he is a church-going family <laughs> man, straight and... Er yeah, I think he's mm -hmm. a very different kind of cop from John McClane. Yeah. And now Hans gets on the radio with Dwayne Robinson. This is, uh, this is uh, Deputy Chief Dwayne Robinson. Who is this? This is Hans Gruber. I assume you realize the futility of direct action against me. We have no wish for further loss of life. And as we see him talking, the camera in the office is moving, tracking back, and goes past the bloody head of Ellis. Mm -hmm. And then we get this speech from Hans where he gives his demands. I have comrades in arms around the world languishing in prison. The American State Department enjoys rattling its saber for its own ends. Now I can rattle it for me. Then he lists the people that should be released. In Northern Ireland, the seven members of the new Provo Front. In Canada, the five imprisoned leaders of Liberté de Québec. In Sri Lanka, the nine members of the Asian Dawn. And you have the great reaction of John McClane going, What the fuck? And <laughs> then Carl mouthing, Asian Dawn? <laughs> yeah. I read about them in Time magazine. It's so much fun, yeah. these characters. And Dwayne is like going, well, I, I don't have the authority to do this. And Hans hangs up on him. Do you think they'll even try to do it? Who cares? Theo is almost done with the mechanical locks and says, One more to go, then it's up to you. And you better be right, because it looks like this last one's going to take a miracle. It's Christmas, Theo. It's the time of miracles. So be of good cheer and call me when you hit the last lock. <laughs> and he goes from that right to... Carl... Hunt that little shit down and get those detonators. And so Carl and Fritz head off to hunt down John McClane and kill him. And Hans is heading up towards the roof to check all of the explosives. And at this moment, John, mm -hmm. I think this is a good time to end part two of our exploration of Die Hard. As always, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this amazing film. Visit us on our Facebook page. You can follow The Cinephiles at Cine underscore files on Twitter, The Cinephiles podcast on Instagram. You can subscribe to the show at all the usual places, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Google Play. Please leave your reviews on Apple Podcasts, your your comments on YouTube. If you want to reach me, you can do so at SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. And right now you could be listening to John Roca on my other podcast, mm. Enterprise Incidents, because we are talking about the only two part series in Star Trek, the original series, the menagerie that is out right now. John, if people wanted to reach you, how would they do it? Yeah, definitely listen to that episode. It was a lot of fun recording with these, with uh, uh, Steve and uh, Scott Mance on Enterprise Incidents for one of my favorite, if not my favorite, Star Trek episodes ever. Uh, yeah, you can follow me at the Roca says on Twitter and on Instagram. Remember my other podcasts, the top ten that's out there uh, that we've got to, and the Geek Buddies as well, wherever you download podcast feeds, and of course my Outlaw Nation channel just crossed seventeen thousand subscribers. So come aboard the train and be a part of that. That's uh, uh, YouTube.com slash John Roca says, go and be a part of all of that. And on Twitch, follow me, the Outlaw Nation on Twitch. So follow me there for all the gameplay and watch alongs I'll be doing with Amazon Prime. 
And I think that's it for this week. We're going to return to Nakatomi Plaza next week to conclude our exploration of Die Hard right here on The Cinephiles. <laughs>